culture from the anthropological point of view, the people, you know, the discipline that's really been studying this thing for about 100 years, in the modern conception, is thought of as shared knowledge. Culture is shared knowledge, and it's take, usually the knowledge is taken for granted. Stuff we know that we don't know we know. How do we know not to look at people in the elevator? Which is what this picture is talking about. How do we know how to order food when we walk into a restaurant? How do we know how to get a taxi or an Uber when we land at an airport? I can tell you if you go to Accra in Ghana, the taxi uh, hailing process is vastly different than it is here in Phoenix. We have millions and millions and millions of these cultural, what we call cultural models in our heads, or mental models, rather, in our heads. The ones that we share are called cultural models. So we tend to share because of a common experience in this country of a common idea of what a good marriage is. I could also ask you questions like, what's a superstar in your company? And we could have the same conversation about your company. Or we could also talk about what a great leader does. I want to introduce you to this idea of what we, what we call a dominant logic. Patrick mentioned this earlier. A dominant logic is a shared mental model. These are called cultural models in the social sciences world. We call them dominant logics in the business world because they have a kind of logic. They, they sort of are a way of making sense. What the neuroscience has sh and the cognitive science has shown us for the last 30 years is that cultures are made up of these shared models, shared mental models that we hold, things that we know that we don't know we know, but nonetheless unify us as a culture, unify us as a way of thinking. And not only thinking, but doing. You can see in the little balls here, it says what, why, and how. There's a sort of, there's a sort of cliche that culture is um, how we do things around here. Well, that's only part of the answer. The modern science conception of culture is that it's not only how we do things around here, it's why we do things and what those things are to begin with. That's culture. You begin to appreciate, when you think about culture in this way, you begin to appreciate some of the complexities that then come with that vis-a-vis -vis change. So dominant logics are atomic little bits of shared, taken-for-granted knowledge. They are how the brain reduces complexity. We are filtering machines. We are filtering out constant bits of information all the time. But we're filtering this information out because we don't need to use this information unless we are forced to in context. I drew your attention to the air conditioning system by asking you a question. So you brought forth a, an idea or a belief about the air conditioning. So these cultural models, these shared mental models, are ways of reducing complexity and making sense of the world. And this is very, very important for culture and very, very important for change leadership because if culture is not values, or attitudes, but it's this shared knowledge. How do we deal with that shared knowledge? The knowledge is pre-verbal, but it takes, usually takes the form of assumptions or beliefs or what we think of as good or rules of thumb or goals or ideals. This is how that, these dominant logics take shape or come, come to the surface, but they are pre-verbal. They're pre-verbal, they're schematic. Those of you in IT or in software engineering know that these are what we call schemas. They're just pre-verbal ways of making sense. Okay, that doesn't matter. That's just geek cognitive science stuff. But what does matter is that to transform your business, you have to deal with these dominant logics. And that's where it gets interesting for a change leader because dominant logics relate closely to your means of production. So some examples, the IRS. We all know the IRS very well. They're in the business of audit and tax collection. And that brings domin forward dominant logics of detail and checking and suspicion, so much so that departments within the IRS are suspicious of each other. This, these logics get over-applied, over-learned. Airlines in the business of safety and transportation and speed, and they sometimes take these logics and apply the I idea of logic excessively to mergers. They merge quickly. United and Continental merged very, very quickly, causing huge disruption, huge issues among the labor force, among schedules, among customers. 
this was an excess speed logic applied to a merger when it necessarily didn't need to, but the logic of, of the business brings forth this idea of speed. Law firms, advocacy, argument, these, these logics sometimes are over-applied where there's constant argument among partners, among divisions, among groups within the law firm. I've been studying Microsoft, my former employer, and I can tell you that Microsoft, having invented the operating system and having gone through uh, the experiences that, that, it, that it did uh, to become the company that it is, has these very strong dominant logics of platforms. When you invent the operating system, suddenly everything is a platform. So if you're writing a printer driver in Microsoft, you tend to think of your printer driver as a platform that others have to write their APIs to. It's an interesting way of thinking. Um, so these are just little, little examples. The idea here is that logics, dominant logics aren't good or bad, they're adaptive. There are ways in which your business or any organization has adapted to its environment. And sometimes they get over applied. So the big question for change leaders is not so much that the logic is good or bad or the culture is good or bad. It's the only question that really matters is how does it stand in the way of what we're trying to do? How does it get in the way of change? The reason why this stuff is hard is because dominant logics come from many sources. We have to understand where the logics come from and why they're there. So when you solve hard problems, that tends to create a set of mental models with a group. Or sometimes a company surviving an existential crisis will create a dominant logic for that company. One of my clients is a defense company that a few years ago, uh, early, early um, late aughts, went through massive uh, government sequestration, meaning the government cut back its defense budgets dramatically. That caused a company of about 5,000 people to lay off half its workforce. That experience was deeply scarring for that business to the, such a degree that today the company is manic, is obsessive about cost control. Even though it's a very different operating environment, uh, the world is different today, they're still obsessive about cost control, having gone through that existential crisis of losing half the company because of government sequestration. Sometimes dominant logics come from a dominant professional group, software engineers in a software company, lawyers in a law firm, doctors in an HMO. These groups have a, a lot of power. Kaiser Permanente, one of my clients, you may know them well, the healthcare provider, their, their uh, doctor part of their organization is actually a separate entity from the administrative part of the business. Why? Because the doctors felt strongly that they did not want the bureaucracy of the administrative part of the business. So Kaiser operates an insurance business, an administrative business, and a, and a client delivery business, and they're all separate. They, they're under one umbrella from a, from a brand perspective, but they run as separate entities. That's the power of a professional group. Sometimes it's history. My 100-year-old client uh, industrial company that I referenced with the gentleman over there, they have been operating for 100 years, and they still do things the way they did 30 years ago in terms of how they run budgets, for example, or how they think about acquisitions. They were, they were a spin-off a spin of a large conglomerate, and they still think about their business as a portfolio. Regions, nations, national, regional influences, influence dominant logics. If you've ever heard of Mittelstand companies, these are the small, very um, influential German industrials. They are all companies who culturally are much more alike than not alike because they come from what particular region of Germany where a lot of the values of workmanship and craft and excellence are shared. And lastly, of course, founders. But founder influences on laminate logics are relatively weak, especially as the company gets bigger. Why does this matter? Who cares? All of these experiences are meaningful. And when you have a meaningful experience, you tend to, that tends to lodge in memory. From a neuroscience perspective, these meaningful experiences shape collective neural pathways. Meaningful experiences shape brain chemistry. So if you want to start to think about changing culture, you have to start to think about how do I change the collective brain chemistry of 100 people, or 1,000 people, or 10,000 people? How do I do that? Do I send them all to a training class? 
I put up value posters? Do I have the CEO give a good speech? You can begin to see that from the cognitive anthropological perspective, those are not really sufficient um, solutions to a culture change problem because the neural pathways are not changing when you do those kinds of things. Not at scale. Not at scale. Thank you.